uh, today's session of the Minnesota Senate Agriculture Broadband and Rural Development Committee for March 25th, 2024 is now in session and a quorum is present. Um, members and members of the public, you do see our agenda for the day, but we have a very important intervention into that agenda. Uh, not just because uh, it's an opportunity to show our affection, but also because there are treats. Senator Westrom's birthday is on Wednesday. We're not going to be here. So now's our chance to sing to him. <laughs> Ready? Here we go. One, two, three. <laughs> Senator Westrom, if you, at your age, still can talk, feel free. <laughs> what, a, what, a, what an idea you hatched. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, um, the pages are going to hand out a little treat. It happens to be an egg with Easter coming up. I think the best eggs around, uh, Reese's peanut butter cup eggs. So uh, uh, I just thought in the, in the spirit of uh, last year, who brought, you brought cupcakes and I uh, was still recovering from a snowmobile accident and couldn't be here, um, I thought I would uh, get out of my comfort zone and uh, bring a little treat to the committee. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, last year for your uh, remembering and uh, gesture. And so I uh, hope everybody can enjoy their egg. And uh, given the idea of not being able to hatch eggs in our school anymore if that legislation were passed. I thought this would be an appropriate treat as well. We should celebrate eggs. And so uh, hope you can enjoy. Thank you, Senator Westrom, for the egg and for getting older. Uh, members, we have uh, two other uh, bits on the agenda today. Our first will be a, a celebration. In fact, not just a discussion, but a celebration of women in agriculture. And then secondly, we will discuss the cannabis provisions, modifications, appropriations. Member, I want, members, I want to remind you that our discussion will be focused exclusively on issues that are ag-related. Uh, if you uh, get into other terms or other issues, I'm going to have to shut you down. Uh, but first off, we're going to start off with Women in Ag Day. And as a way of initiating our discussion, there is a resolution that our very own Assistant Commissioner Andrea Vobel is going to read for us all right now. Commissioner Vobel. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. For the record, my name is Andrea Vobel. I serve as Deputy Commissioner at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Uh, it is an honor to be here with you today on Women in Ag Day. I want to uh, first say a big shout out to Senator Mary Kunish, who um, prompted this conversation and, and this day. And we're so grateful for her leadership and Senator Gustafson and Senator Seeberger um, for their leadership on the Ag Committee. So thank you so much for having us. Um, so as a representative of the Walls Flanagan administration, I wanted to read uh, the proclamation that they issued for today, so I will proceed. Whereas Minnesota proudly recognizes that our farmers have always fed our state, our nation, and our world, and whereas in addition to farm operators, women are making a difference across Minnesota in research and development, manufacturing, sales and distribution, agricultural education, agribusiness, and advocacy, which extends benefits to individuals around the globe, and whereas Minnesota recognizes the significant positive impact women in agriculture have on food resources and the agricultural workforce, and whereas women who are instructors, leaders, and professionals in the agricultural field deserve to be celebrated for their efforts in fostering the next generation of the agricultural workforce by promoting STEM and agricultural education and entrepreneurial and community initiatives. And whereas Minnesota recognizes the significant positive impact women in agriculture have on food resources in the agricultural workforce. And whereas Minnesota celebrates the old and new ways in which women's energy and determination are helping to keep our agricultural system strong. Now, therefore, I, Tim Walls, Governor of Minnesota, do hereby proclaim Monday, March 25th, 2024, as Women in Agriculture Day in the state of Minnesota. Thank you very much, Deputy Commissioner Vobel. Uh, now, uh, our friends, Senators Kunish and Gustafson, are going to uh, set us off uh, in our celebration of women in agriculture, if you would, please.
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks um, all members and those that have joined us. Uh, unfortunately, the weather had, um, has not cooperated with us. Otherwise, you'd see tens of tens of uh, women who work in the agricultural uh, uh, community, ranchers, all of those sort of folks here today to support each other and celebrate um, this really incredible day. Women farmers and ranchers um, were to be here from all over Minnesota. We're hoping to create more and more awareness of the growing number of women leading in agriculture, managing farm, ranch operations across Minnesota. It's interesting to know that the recent census of agriculture data from 2022 just came out and there are 35,623 female producers in Minnesota. And that is up from 34,517 in the last census five years ago. Women producers are managing 9,634 no, 9,634,361 acres of farmland. And I find um, these facts so fascinating and so interesting as we have been discussing all things agriculture, um, but not really recognizing the role of women in, in, in that. And so I think I'll, I'll hand it over to um, Senator Gustafson and then I'll con um, conclude at the end. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members, for allowing us to celebrate Women in Egg Day. I am the granddaughter of Iowa beef uh, ranchers. Um, they had a very small but uh, very uh, robust uh, ranch farm in Iowa. And my grandma was tough as nails and no nonsense, as many women in agriculture are. I remember taking many uh, pickup trucks. And pickup is a loose term. There was no floor. Um, I mean, there was enough to hold the seat, but you could see the field underneath your feet, and she just didn't care. It was a tough life, and she managed to, uh, to get it done, and they were semi-successful at it, and they sold the farm, and I think we were all pretty crushed, but it was a really good childhood. It taught me really uh, quite a bit about hard work, um, and just if you need to get it done... Ask a woman in agriculture. They are about the toughest <laughs> group of women I think I've ever met. They roll up their sleeves and they just get to work. So I've always appreciated that about my grandma and all the other women in agriculture that I've met through this job. Um, in addition to farm operators, women are making a difference across Minnesota in research and development, manufacturing, sales and distribution, agricultural education, agribusiness, and advocacy. Minnesota women in agriculture deserve to be celebrated for their efforts in fostering the next generation of the agriculture workforce by promoting STEM and agriculture education, entrepreneurial, and community initiatives. Senator Kunish and I are proud to be joined by women from across Minnesota to share their experiences in this first annual Women in Agriculture Day. I am proud to recognize the women who have been involved in the leaders in Minnesota's agriculture industry, but their voices have not always been heard. Today that changes. Today we proudly recognize the farmers who have always fed not only our state, but the country and the world. And we celebrate the old and new ways in which women's energy and determination are helping to keep our agricultural system strong. Thank you. Thank you, Senators uh, Kunish and Gustafson. Uh, members, we have a, a series of folks who are going to testify for us to share their experiences and talk a little bit about the, the role and the experiences of women in agriculture. Uh, we are going to hold all questions or discussion until we've heard from everybody. Um, our first presenter... A testifier is Ms. Heinrichs from the University of Minnesota Extension. Ms. Heinrichs, if you would please unmute your microphone, turn on your camera, state your full name for the record, and begin your testimony when you're ready. Please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and Senators Kunish and Gustafson. My name is Suzanne Heinrichs. I am an Extension educator, and I live near Brainerd, Minnesota. Um, I appreciate all the other distinguished, distinguished members that are there today, and we are appreciative of this conversation and thankful to be here to celebrate women in agriculture. We echo the thank you to you, Senator Kunish, for just initiating this day, and we're so thankful. Women have long been involved in agriculture, and Senator Gustafson's story is so reminiscent of others. Many women who have not only worked on their farm to make it viable, but also been involved with keeping their books, making decisions on the farm, oftentimes very much in the background. 
They also raised kids and kept food on the table. For many genera generations, there have been women involved in farming. They haven't been heard all that often in the history books, but theirs is a voice that needs to be heard. And today's women in agriculture are here. They're here today to share about their farms and involvement in agriculture. Many were going to drive great distances, like Senator Kunish said, to be a part of this inaugural Women of Ag Day at the Capitol. But as you know, we've turned it virtual. So there are many people and families watching on YouTube. And I'll say many families with children, since there isn't school in many places across the state. We, have, we had over 40 people register for today's event. Even more were able to uh, uh, be a part of it because we did this virtually. So it's a great start to an annual event. Like I said, I'm Suzanne Henricks. I work for University of Minnesota Extension. We provide educational efforts for all farmers on topics such as livestock crops, food safety, horticulture, and agricultural business management topics. We know that women in agriculture are managing farms and leading in new ways. Senator Kuna shared that there are almost 36,000 female producers in Minnesota. That's up over 1,000 people since the last census. So an interesting change is that more and more female farmers are claiming farming as their primary occupation. Women who state their primary occupation as farming has increased by 270, which is almost over, that's almost 12,000 women. The average size farm currently is at, in Minnesota, at 388 acres, and farming continues to grow, and so do small farms. The census of agriculture is voluntary, and thanks to our friends at the Statewide Cooperative Partnership, many of our representatives made up of men, I'm sorry, made up of representatives from many agricultural organizations. We know from their work that there are many women farmers who aren't counted in that census of agriculture. So we think the number is even larger than what's reported. And not only are women um, farming, they are leading in agricultural organizations. From our own extension dean, Beverly Durgan, to Andrea Vabel, the Deputy Commissioner at Minnesota Department of Agriculture, women are making a difference in agriculture and in the agricultural sector. We have a group of seven ambitious women who are involved in agriculture in some way, shape, or form who are ready to speak to you today. These speakers are coming to us from Minnesota in the north, as far north as Black Duck and the Red Lake Nation, west by Pipestone and south by Rochester, and places in between. And they are here to share information about their everyday lives and about their farms or organizations and a bit about their challenges and successes. You might not hear them talk about the systemic challenges that face rural communities, such as childcare and health insurance, but women in agriculture grapple with these challenges too. So I will turn it over to my colleague, Amy Johnston, to share some survey results. Thank you, Ms. Heinrichs. Uh, and to all those uh, children watching at home that you mentioned, nothing says snow day like watching a Senate hearing. <laughs> uh, Ms. Johnson, if you would, please state your full name for the record. Turn on your uh, microphone. Actually, do that first. State your full name for the record, and then turn on your camera and commence your testimony when you're ready, please. Good afternoon. My name is Amy Johnston, um, and I am an extension educator with University of Minnesota Extension. Um, so again, Senators, Thank you for spending part of your day today celebrating this inaugural Women in Ag Day by learning about women-led agriculture in Minnesota. We have prepared um, for you two summaries of different Minnesota Ag-specific surveys. The first summary um, entitled Women in Ag Day Handout 2 is selected data from the 2022 Statewide Cooperative Partnership Survey. Um, details about the statewide cooperative partnership and the survey are included in the su summary report. In Minnesota, women-led small-scale farms are more likely to have less acres of crops and lower farm sales compared to the average small-scale farm. More women-led small-scale farms reported having to price their crops below actual cost which is one contributing factor to having to self-finance their farms with non-farm funds. However, a positive 
73% of women-led small-scale farms reported owning their land versus renting. The second summary entitled Women in Ag Day Survey Results is a report detailing priorities of many women in agriculture. A survey overview is included in the report. Women who completed the survey work in a variety of areas of agriculture, with farming being the largest group. The type of farming ranged from ranching and raising livestock to organic farming, to specialty crop farming of fruits, vegetables, and herbs, to cut fruit or to cut flowers, poultry and egg production, dairy production, and commodity crops. The challenges faced by these survey respondents can be grouped into four categories. These are categories, are challenges in farm management, financial, rural life, and well-being. Access, or rather a lack of access, is at the root of many of these challenges. Lack of access to market, land, financing, services including childcare and veterinary services, affordable health and health care insurance and mental health care are all challenges based on a daily basis. Survey respondents also shared solutions to some of their barriers they have faced. Many barriers have been overcome, but others were solved with one solution that led to a new problem. And then lastly, women shared how they defined success on their farm or in their household. Success is more than having financial stability but that's very important. Um, it also includes having balanced lives, positively contributing to their communities, and growing not just as a farm or business, but as a person and a family. And while we have provided you with this data, it's even more meaningful to hear directly from women who are not only leaders on their farms, branches, and businesses, but also leaders in their homes and communities. These women will now share their own personal stories of their experiences in agriculture. First to share is Lauren Beegler of Beegler Farms in Lake Benton, Minnesota. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Ms. Beegler, if you would please turn on your microphone, turn on your camera, and uh, commence your testimony when you're, state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready. Good afternoon, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Lauren Beegler. Um, I'm actually from Lake Wilson, Minnesota. Um, little distinction there. So thank you for um, allowing this time this afternoon. Good afternoon to everyone there. Um, like I said, my name is Lauren Bigler. I live clear in Southwest Minnesota, uh, with Murray County, um, just outside of a very small town called Lake uh, I grew up on my family farm in North Central Iowa and against my better judgment, married my husband, Brian, and moved to Minnesota to make Minnesota home. Sorry. I just had to make a joke and um, <laughs> live on the farm that uh, we currently operate that was his family farm that's been in the family since 1886. Uh, we have three children. They are 12, 14, 15, which in and of itself is a full-time job. Um, having active kids is a blessing and a curse, especially when you live 20 minutes out of the town your school is in. So I spend a lot of time on the road, um, but it's a job I wouldn't trade for the world. Um, on our farm, we manage about 2,500 acres of corn and soybeans, and over the past decade or so, have transitioned our farm um, to a more to lots of conservation methods, um, util utilizing um, things such as cover crops, uh, no-tilling, and strip tillage as some examples. Um, our surrounding water, Lake Shatek, which isn't too far east of us, um, it's a big draw for the area. So uh, we want to make sure that we're doing our best to keep our surrounding waters and environment um, in good shape and something we hope to have a positive impact on. And keeping our soil also in its uh, invaluable nutrients in place is um, very important to us also. Um, aside from the work that happens on the farm and needs to happen on the farm, Brian and I try to contribute to our local community and even larger. Um, off the farm, I work part-time at a local preschool, which I enjoy very much. I'm a member of our school board. I'm also a member um, on our county corn and soy growers group and try to give as much time possible volunteering for school, served on church council, started a running group for girls at our school. Um, I also volunteer with a group called Common Ground, 
which is a group of women in agriculture dedicated to informing and educating consumers about how their food is produced. Um, Common Ground has provided some of my favorite and most fulfilling time off the farm in the last 10 years. Um, Brian is not exempt. He helped coach um, our son's football and basketball teams while also serving um, on the Minnesota Corn Growers Association um, on the executive leadership team and as a director for the last seven years. <clears throat> and I list all these not to point out that what we do is special or above and beyond because I'm sure a lot of the other women you will hear from today could very likely do more <laughs> than we do. I'm probably sure they do. Um, but it's a testament to how agriculture and our rural areas need strong communities to have healthy farms and vice versa. We need farms that are properly supported with laws and regulations, which in turn helps our local communities thrive and continue to support this way of life that we love and appreciate so much. So since I get this time today in front of you all, um, my ask would be is that we ensure future laws and legislation have been thoroughly scrutinized and vetted to be the most logical for our farmers. Have we ensured that we've heard enough voices that we vote on and implement making positive changes to helping our farms instead of um, possible roadblocks or added administrative tasks? Are we finding ways to help our rural communities, whether this is healthcare or education, which are both critical issues we need solutions for in our rural areas? And lastly, I would just end with, um, we welcome any of you or anyone on our farm at any time. Uh, we love to tell people about what we do and allowing them to experience a little slice of life um, on our farm. And I know all the other women here today would probably echo that. Um, we have a lot of joy in opening up our farm and sharing about what we do. So thank you for your time. I'll turn it over to the numerous other women you'll hear from today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Bigler. Um, Ms. Ferrier, are you in here? You are present? Uh, if you would please come to the table, state your full name for the record, and commence your testimony when you're ready. My name is Tiffany Ferrier. I live in Hawick, Minnesota, which is in Candy, Ohio County, located um, 30 minutes both from Wilmer and St. Cloud. I am here today to kind of give you a story of my challenges and my success as a female farmer. Six years ago today, my husband and myself purchased property located in Hawick, Minnesota. We had the intention of some peace and quiet. Little did I know how quickly that would change. I bought a few goats and chickens. I was informed by my neighbor when we purchased the property that I had an acre and a half of asparagus that I needed to learn to contend with. As any farmer knows, it always starts with just a few. I soon learned that I had a passion for these mischief-making creatures, and so off we went. I had no infrastructure in place. There was no housing, no barns, no nothing on the property. I started building and acquiring lumber from NARTS to build such housing. With over 100 goats at this point, I realized I had a potential business opportunity, but I had no infrastructure. I signed up for a goat meat workshop held by the U of M Extension Officer, Siddhar Mamadov. I found a new passion for exploring the market of goat meat into a Muslim community. I made several attempts to meet with store owners and community members of the St. Cloud and Wilmer area, but I had no idea where to really start. Meanwhile, I began to reach out to different financial institutions for funding to upgrade my infrastructure and help support growth. After many rabbit holes and dead ends, doors finally started to seem like they were opening. I was approached by a man named Justice Walker. At the time, he worked for the MMDC out of Wilmer. He introduced me to elders in the community of Wilmer and other local store owners. While relationships were being built with store owners in Wilmer, Sadar Mamadov helped me create relationships with community members and elders in the St. Cloud area. While we were still struggling with the financial funding, every time I went to an institute, the things that I heard were, I was a first-time female farmer with no experience. I was a female first-time farmer with no education. I had no collateral, and goats were not considered livestock at that time. I was at my wit's end. I finally reached out to Compere Financial. And I found someone who saw my vision. Not only did they want to see my infrastructure come into place, but they wanted to help support and grow my whole farm. 
fast track a few months. We now have the infrastructure in place. We have got fresh goat meat into local stores in both the Wilmer and the St. Cloud area. As any livestock producer knows, processing has definitely been a challenge. There has been a bottleneck. For six months of 20, in the year 2022, we were processing goat meat and the rates continued to seem to increase every week, as well as the struggles along with that. After six months of processing, the prices had gotten to the point where it was not feasible for community members or stores to continue processing because it was too expensive. We had to quit processing altogether, which really meant selling goats altogether. So back at the drawing board I was. I'm a very driven person and I wasn't going to let this stop my dream or impact the communities I was working with. Despite being a female first time farmer with no background in farming, despite raising a non-livestock animal, despite my pretend farming, I am here today to share my success. This year we are in mid construction of an on-site processing facility to make sure the underserved communities have access to fresh goat meat. I assume the president role of our local farmer's market and am in the planning stages of large scale, large scale high tunnel to be able to grow more produce for our local communities and markets. And we plan to make all of Candy Acres products mobile this year. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Fair. Uh, Ms. Spears, are, are you in the room? If you would please uh, come to the table. Uh, state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready, please. Anin, Sherilyn Spears, Jagura Sheik and Dijna Kaz. Miskwagami Mizagai Gunning and Dunjiba, Migazi and Dunde. My English name again is Sherilyn Spears. I come from the Red Lake Nation and my clan is uh, Eagle Clan. And I, first of all, I want to thank you all for taking time to listen to the women in ag. And um, Red Lake wasn't always, um, has always been in agriculture. I remember a story in the 1930s when there was a famine and my gra great grandfather was tasked with um, growing food. But he didn't grow it only for the Red Lake Nation. He grew it for the people in the whole surrounding areas and he shared with that. And I always have been really proud of him for doing that. Well, the ch current tribal chairman, he held a series of meetings in Red Lake and asked the people what they wanted to see happen while he was in tenure of the, as chairman. And they said, why, are, why did we have our food hauled in, trucked in? You know, why come we don't grow our own food? We have all this land here. And so I was a project coordinator, so they tasked me with, with doing this. So in 2015, I started a feasibility study for Buffalo. And we're currently up to 45 buffalo right now. We want to get to the point where we're feeding our children in the schools buffalo tribal programs. And um, also, of course, into our cas casino so we can come sustainable. We're also, um, right away I constructed a six foot high fence to grow our produce. Otherwise the deer would have just came and ate everything. So we're really planning on you're not sovereign unless you can feed your people. And although we still have 400 gardens, that's not enough. We still have to teach our young people how to grow their food. And so we just, the newly established Ag Department in, in May of um, 2022, um, we started a training. We also, we have graduated, we have one organic female farmer and one male. And that's just the start. We're gonna continue training our people and our young people. They're just so interested in all of this. We're also, because of our opiate epidemic, we've also started training them in making our own medicines and our teas. And right now we have this one oil that we feel we, we've perfected it that's helping our elders with their pains and helping with um, um, sore muscles and you know whatever comes from working really hard. And um, our plan is to grow an acre, starting off with an acre of onions, carrots, potatoes, and uh, celery. So that's what everybody uses, but it's all gonna be organic. I'm concerned about our water. Got our water tested, it's good, except there's a little bit of that 2,4-D in there. You know, even that little bit is too much. And let's really, really try to figure out how we can protect our water so we can keep on feeding our animals. and. Uh, providing water to our, our food source. And then one, one other thing that my grant writer asked me to throw in there is to try to streamline the forms and the budget templates and everything. And let's not, we already have enough barriers. Let's try to figure out how we can make it easier. 
And again, I want to say appreciate um, the grants that have been given out because they truly, truly help. We put them to good use. Next thing we need is a processing center for our food and our meat. Once we have that, I'll be willing to share with everybody and anybody in the state of Minnesota our food that we grow. Miigwech. Miigwech. Thank you very much, Ms. Spears. Uh, I believe we're going back online now. Uh, Ms. Morrison, uh, if you are available, could you please unmute your microphone, turn on your camera, and start your testimony when you're ready. And state your full name for the record, please. Hello, uh, I'm Debbie Morrison, and I am the co-owner of Sapsucker Farms, which is up in Kwamba. And if you've never heard of Kwamba, you're not alone. A lot of people haven't. Um, it's right outside of Mora. In fact, our address is Mora because Kwamba doesn't have a post office. Um, but we have a certified organic farm here, and it's become a community hub uh, and kind of an attraction in Minnesota where we draw um, visitors from all over the state. Um, I also grow a very specialty crop. I grow ginger. Last year, I harvested 1,000 pounds of ginger. Um, but I've always considered myself an accidental farmer. I, I say that because I, being a farmer was never on my radar. I, um, it's something that I happened into, excuse me, happened into. I grew up in the Twin Cities. Um, I went to the U of M where I met my husband, Jim Morrison, and then I spent 30 years in the corporate world as a marketing executive. Um, simultaneously, uh, uh, for the past 20 years, been kind of incrementally growing what we have here at Sapsucker Farms. Um, it started actually in 1997. Uh, we bought a plot of 172 acres up here by Kwamba. Uh, we originally camped here for three years, and then in 2000, we built a house and moved up here from, from the cities. And then our first uh, farm crop was maple syrup which is how we got the name Sap Sucker Farms. Uh, we started with 30 taps and now we do 1,000 taps. Um, also, the, the garden that I had kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger, eventually it got up to um, about an acre. And so in 2012, I quit the corporate world to manage the farm full time. And I started a CSA, uh, which stands for Community Supported Agriculture. It's like a uh, subscription of fresh vegetables. Um, I was growing about 50 different kinds of vegetables. And so each week you would get something different, whatever is ripe that week. Um, so I also started beekeeping. And when I started beekeeping, my husband said, well, if you're gonna get bees, I'm gonna put in an apple orchard. So it's like, okay, cool. Apple orchard it is, so we planted 100 apple trees. And then it was right around that same time we had an abundance of apples. And uh, originally the goal was to make fresh apple juice. Um, and we had more apple juice than we could sell or drink. And so my husband posted on a brewer's website, anyone wondering, wanting fresh, organic, raw apple juice to make hard cider, so these small uh, cider makers or would, would buy our cider and then make a five gallon batch and put it in the state fair and then they would win first, second and third place for a couple years in a row. So we decided, well, maybe we should start making hard cider. So in 2014, we started making yellow belly hard cider, it's, which is now distributed in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And uh, then we needed more space for production. And so in 2019, we built a 6,400 square foot cider barn here with a tap room uh, and room for the production. And it's a, it's a, it's a big uh, space and we've really enjoyed being able to share that space with, with the community. So we have a lot of local artists who come here to teach classes. We have vendor events with artisans who, who you know, so they can sell their items. Local musicians come and, and play here. We also host a lot of educational seminars, uh, particularly with the U of M Extension, and then other people with subject matter expertise. Um, the farm is open to the public, um, it, so people can come and explore. They can see the growing operation, including the ginger that's being grown here, um, play with the chickens. We have about 90 free range uh, laying hens that are everywhere um, and hike the trails uh, and dogs are invited, are, are welcome all the time too. Um, in order to be family friendly, we also produce 
uh, root beer and ginger ale made from the ginger grown here and apple juice and other non-alcohol products as well. Plus we have food trucks. So um, every, every weekend as well. So it's been a really rewarding experience for me over the last 20 years to be able to um, incorporate my uh, marketing skills with my, my passion for the farm to create an agritourism venue that so many people enjoy, especially us. Um, so now it's my goal to put Kwamba on the map. And so I hope you'll come up to Kwamba, um, visit Kwamba, stop by at the farm. Uh, we're open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And just go to our website, sapsuckerfarms.com, and you can see all of the activities we have going on. And thank you very much for um, celebrating women in ag. Thank you very much, Ms. Morrison. Ms. Gray, if you would, please, uh, unmute your microphone, state your full name for the record, turn on your camera, and commence your testimony when you're ready, if you would, please. Um, there. Hi. My name is Rachel Gray. Um, I am a cattle rancher in northern Minnesota, so I'm about 60 miles from the Canadian border, um, north of Black Duck, Minnesota. Um, thank you for inviting Women in Ag to speak to you today and give us a chance to tell you about all of these amazing diverse operations. As you know, ag plays a huge role in Minnesota economics and women are really an integral part of that role. We offer a unique perspective for both farm policy, farm problems, and farm solutions. When I was a high school student, quite a while ago, actually in 1992, my senior year, um, I was asked to write a career paper and in that career paper, my whole focus was on developing an ag business. At that time in my school, that was not really something that um, the guidance counselor ever heard a lot of. And so when I finished the paper, the paper had an A on the back. You know, it was correct for grammar and correct for writing. And the comment on the very bottom of the paper, which I actually have hanging on my office wall, says, but if you want to be a farmer, you probably should marry one. And that stuck with me. Um, that actually caused me to change my whole career. Um, I became a teacher instead. And in the back of my mind, I always wanted to be a farmer. So after 14 years of teaching school, um, my husband said to me, and he's not a farmer, uh, he works in the mining industry, uh, typically is overseas and home about four times a year. He said to me, um, if farming is your dream, I think you should stop teaching and do what you need to do. So I came back to the farm I grew up on. So I'm now the fourth generation here. I came back in 2008, worked with my parents for four years, and then in 2012, I bought their operation. When I bought the operation, we were a cow-calf operation. We had 180 head, and we ran cattle on about 1,900 acres. Um, if you were to come today to feed with me in the snow, which I, I finished a while ago, um, today we fed 660 head of cattle. And we have an operation that spans on about 3,000 acres. So we definitely have expanded. Um, we needed to expand to bring home the next generation, which is my son, which is fifth generation, and including his grandkids, or my grandkids, his kids, which are the sixth. And we look forward to having them join the operation. Of course, when you have an operation like this, um, you're constantly trying to make room and trying to diversify and think about how you can um, support the family coming back and what you can do. One thing that we have always been very focused on is conservation. Um, my grandfather was on uh, the Soil and Water Board in 1950, and I now have his seat on that board all these years later. We are water quality certified, and this year we've been nominated for the National Environmental Stewardship Award for Cattlemen. So that's a, a really big honor to even be nominated. Um, the application is immense that we went through. Um, it goes through our whole farm, um, our nutrient management plans, all of the things that we have to do to be, to be safe and to be successful. Uh, we feel that that is very important here. As we've expanded, the other thing that we feel is important is our ability to market animals, not only within the state, but also interstate. Um, I do a lot of business in other states because we develop 500 heifers a year that are considered ranch building heifers. So my goal is to help ranchers throughout the United States build herds uh, that genetically work for their area. So we have placed heifers and done um, business down in Georgia, uh, 
Alabama, Tennessee, West Virginia, and the surrounding states too, North Dakota, South Dakota. Um, and our business is to really look at the genetics of cattle and make sure that we are uh, getting cattle to ranches that are going to build ranches. So I always say I'm a ranch builder. Um, my ask today would be that you continue to look to farmers and ranchers in Minnesota, particularly the women that are here, uh, very well versed in their careers, well versed in what they do. My ask would be that you look to them and to other farmers as you build policy. I think it's very important to, as Roosevelt said, talk to the people in the arena in his fam famous speech. Uh, the people in the arena know what's going on. Any one of you is always welcome at my place. We have a very open door policy. We do a lot of tours and grazing tours, how to manage the grass, how to manage the land. That is kind of our forte. All the cattle here are rotationally grazed throughout the summer. We believe in keeping out of surface water. So we have over, I think this year we will hit our 20th mile mark of, of continuous fence around our areas. Different places on the farm, we pump water up to five miles so that we do not water in ponds or surface water because we believe that's really important uh, for the environment, but also for our cattle. Watering cattle on well water and in freshwater situations gives you 10% more gain, which we all know we need to be sustainable in three ways. Community, you know, we need a, a sustainable community. We need to be environmentally sustainable and economically sustainable. So we focus on those things here. Um, and yeah, again, my ask would be to, to look to the women here with questions on policy, with questions on things like that. Concerning issues in my area, when I talk to other women that are ranchers or farmers, we're very concerned about the drought up here. Uh, we've been in D2 all winter. That is a very, very uh, serious thing for this county and the surrounding counties. Our ponds are low, our, our lakes and rivers are, are low right now, that is a concern. And rural, chi rural child care. Having my grandchildren back on the farm has really, really uh, opened my eyes to the lack of rural child care. We have a six-year-old and a three-year-old farming with us at least two to three days a week. Um, when there's school, when there's no school, and Black Tick is a four-day school week, so Audrey is with us every Monday. Jackson is often out of daycare because daycare is closed or this or that is happening. And so that child care system is something that really affects rural moms and rural grandmas. Uh, we are often farming with our kids in the tractor with us. So those would be my, my points. We are always open to questions, comments, um, all of that. So thank you for having us today. And I feel, um, I feel very honored that in this day and age, probably I would hope no girl in Minnesota would get the comment on her paper that she better marry a farmer. She can be the farmer. Thank you very much, Ms. Gray. Um, uh, our next testifiers are Ms. Huff, Ms. Lufkin, and Ms. Omen. I believe you're all online. Uh, if you could please um, turn your camera. I'll meet your microphone, state your full name for the record, and commence your testimony when you're ready. Mr. Chairman and Senators, I'm Deanne Lufkin, here with my partners Kathy uh, Huff and Jackie Omen. We are the three owners and founders of Cannon Bell's Cheese in Cannon Falls, Minnesota. Uh, we began uh, over 12 years ago as a hobby in the kitchen. We were making beer and wine, but it was going bad before we could finish it. So we decided to ferment milk because Kathy or Jackie lived on a dairy farm at the time. So we fermented that and it started turning out pretty good. We had our friends and family asking for it before we ever had it made. Um, so we were on to something. Uh, I was an Air Force meteorologist getting ready to retire and needing a new job. Uh, Jackie was a youth pastor looking for a new job. Uh, neither of us had ag backgrounds, so we needed help with that. So we invited our partner and good friend, Kathy, to join us. She grew up on a dairy farm, used to have her own dairy herd, and has a degree in, uh, in ag. So she was a perfect person to bring on. We then uh, visited over a dozen different cheese plants in Minnesota and Wisconsin. All but one of them was run by women. 
um, we took courses on how to make cheese and then got a consultant who helped us lay the groundwork for our business because none of us have business degrees. So it was a difficult hurdle for us. We incorporated and then tried to figure out how can we make cheese safely and in um, a way that we could sell it out to the public. So we found that the only place at the time to rent commercial cheese making equipment was at the University of Minnesota. We ended up making cheese there for about seven years before our own plant was built. Uh, about almost a year after we started making cheese at the University of Minnesota, we entered our queso fresco, which is a Spanish style cheese, a recipe we developed in our kitchens. We entered that into the American Cheese Society competition and won first place in our category. So that showed all these money people that we weren't just three bored housewives that thought, ooh, this will be fun. Um, it showed that we actually knew what we were doing um, and gave us more credibility with bankers and grants and so forth. So we continued to work on building our own cheese plant, which is very difficult because dairy regulations had recently changed and become much more strict. Uh, while we were trying to meet over this, we realized there was no coffee shop in Cannon Falls uh, where we wanted to meet. So we decided to open up our own coffee shop in Cannon Falls. And from there, we decided to also sell ice cream. So we opened Cannonbell's Coffee and Ice Cream on April 1st, five years ago. Um, that is also where we sell, that's our storefront for our cheese business too. We have breakfast and lunch options. We partner with different producers from around our area. So we get bread from Northfield, vegetables from a farm down the road, turkey from Ferndale, turkey farms here in Cannon Falls. Uh, we try to get as many local ingredients as possible and then highlight them uh, in our shop so people know where their food comes from. Uh, so the coffee outlet for us. Uh, during that whole time, we were working on, like I said, this cheese plant. Redhead Creamery up in Bruton had told us it took them seven years to build their plant. And we thought, oh, we'll never take that long. It took us seven years to build our plant. Um, so April of 2022, we opened our own facility here in Cannon Falls, finally, um, where we make Gouda, cheddar, Colby, queso fresco, and of course, cheese curds. Um, we partner with different uh, suppliers from around our area. So over 90% of our ingredients come from within 25 miles of our cheese plant. Uh, our spices come from Northfield. Our peppers come from a farm just outside of Cannon Falls and another farm in Northfield. And then our milk comes from Square Deal Dairy, which is only five miles down the road, a fifth generation family dairy that takes extraordinary care of their cows, which shows in the quality of their milk. When we make our cheese, we pump our way off into a trailer and bring it back to the farm. And it is added to the rations for their cows to further improve their nutrition because whey is what you find in baby formula or muscle milk, you know, muscle protein drinks. So it's the good stuff and helps those cows even more. Um, we have also partnered with many female producers the majority of cheesemakers in Minnesota are women, which is kind of extraordinary. And actually, throughout the American Cheese Society, every time we go to the conference, we see more and more and more women. I, I think almost a majority of it is female now. Um, we have been part of various local food peer groups. And in those peer groups, the majority, again, are women. Uh, we are also part of a women's business peer group in Cannon Falls. Um, where we team up with each other to help each other out um, and just try to also make the town better in general, um, bringing back old traditions that had fallen off years ago. Um, so it's kind of fun to watch the town grow. <clears throat> We're also part of our Cannon River Sustainable Farming Association, which the board is all women, except for one man. Again, women running ag. Uh, and from there, we're. We're getting more partnerships and, and more connections to getting more local ingredients. So it's these continual partnerships that we have that help us grow our business. We like to highlight these partnerships because not only does it show that we care about where our food comes from, but 
we can show you the care that our producers take in their product, which helps improve our product at the same time. Um, one thing we'd like to highlight for you all is the farm to school program. It has been extraordinary for us. We have been able to sell thousands of pounds of cheese to these school systems throughout the state. Um, and it's all due to these grants that you all have provided to these schools. Um, from that, we know the kids are getting a better quality product. Our cheese has no additives or preservatives, none of the junk in it. Uh, so they're just getting good, pure, healthy ingredients. Uh, we love it so much that we actually have gone out to some of these schools and helped serve lunch, which is close to my heart. My mom was my school cook, actually worked in my school. Um, so I felt like I was back to my roots. But we've had fun serving, um, serving lunch to these kids and visiting with them and hearing what they think about it. Uh, so it's been a really good time. Um, Plus, we just know the kids are getting better food, so uh, we would ask that you keep that program going um, and potentially invest more money into that. Uh, but we are proud to say we are part of this Women Agricultural Program and uh, proud to say we're from Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next testifier is Lillian Otieno. Uh, Ms. Otieno, are you, uh, you're virtual, yes? If you could please then uh, turn on your microphone uh, and your camera, state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready, please. Thank you, Chair Putnam and the uh, committee. My name is Lillian Otieno and I am uh, the director of the Emerging Farmers Office at the Minnesota Department of, of Agriculture. I'm honored to be here today representing my office uh, and also Emerging Farmers in Minnesota, and for this inaugural occasion, celebrating and honoring women in agriculture at the Capitol. I wanna say thank you to Senator Kunish for leading this effort together with uh, University of Minnesota Extension and the many partners who are also part of this effort. I would be remiss if I don't say another thank you to uh, Deputy Commissioner Verbal, who's been a steady hand at uh, the Department of Agriculture, uh, leading and showing us an example as a woman on how, what it is like to, to actually work in this area. And of course, uh, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan, who's been a stalwart champion uh, for emerging farmers. My office, which is a first of its kind in, this, uh, in the nation, engages with women from diverse backgrounds, orientations, and farming journeys. These women are urban uh, farmers. Uh, they are new Americans, immigrants, refugees, um, like me. Uh, they are indigenous producers. Uh, they engage in mixed operation types of farming. Uh, they speak very many languages, and sometimes, and a lot of times, language access is a barrier. And of course, they also grapple with access to land and access to capital. They also care about the changing and often now unpredictable weather patterns. But these are the heroines making it happen in agriculture. They are also mentors to other women and to other farmers. From incubator farms to careers in agriculture to representation at the legislature, these women have displayed tenacity and unwavering strength, determination, and leadership in pursuing agriculture as a viable economic opportunity besides the obstacles, which those obstacles and barriers are what the Emerging Farmers Office is working hard towards trying to address those issues that prevent a lot of folks, including women, from participating in this ag economy. My story is their story. Their story is my story. That story is often of representation and participation and it is also the story of the voices not in this room and not in this call today. However, I do thank the legislature and I do thank all our supporters and everyone who has had a hand behind the scenes in making sure that Minnesota is a leader in recognizing that we can actually support local food systems and we can actually pay attention to emerging farmers and most importantly, women in agriculture. Thank you so much today for having me here. Thank you very much. We have one final testifier who was not on the agenda, and it's our very own Senator Seberger. Uh, so Senator Seberger, if you would mind, uh, we know who you are, so I don't have to state your name, but if you would please uh, tell us what you got to share, because this sounds cool. 
It's very cool, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, when I heard about Women in Ag Day, I thought of my mom and her sisters. My mom grew up on a farm in Echo, Minnesota, which is in Senator Dames' district. And she was one of eight children. There were seven girls and one boy. And I thought, you know, if anybody embodies the, the notion of women in agriculture, it's my mom and her sisters and family growing up. So I talked to my mom and I said, hey, mom, you want to, we're doing this women in ag thing. And would you want to come in and talk? And she was totally down to come in and do that. Um, then the weather happened and then um, I'm not even there. So, but what she did is she wrote up a little statement and I think that's in your packet and there's some cool photos. And I would like to read the statement on her behalf. So her statement is as follows. My name is Jane Maliner and I was born and raised on a farm in Echo, Minnesota. I am currently 85 years old and have fond memories of growing up on a farm. Living on a farm was a wonderful way to grow up. I learned some life skills like gardening and canning and animal care that I still use. I still have a small garden and make pickles like we used to when I was growing up. I had six sisters and one brother and we all helped with the farm work. We drove tractor, milked cows, fed chickens and helped make hay or whatever needed to be done. There was no distinction between men and women or boys and girls. We all helped and did what we needed, what needed to be done. There's a good feeling of accomplishment when you harvest what has been planted. I enjoyed being outside in the sunshine and fresh air and still feel like it is a great way of life for anyone. And included in her statement, there's a few photos. You can see a picture of all the kids um, in the family and then the next one, they're, they're building. They're building in addition to their house. And they actually, they built a barn and um, they still get together. There's three living sisters um, and they still get together and all the cousins and all the family, we still gather in Bellevue um, about once a year, or once every two years. And two summers ago, we actually went out to the farm and we saw the, the barn that they built. And I've got kind of a neat picture of the, of the, of the sisters next to the barn that they built. But Anyway, thanks for allowing me this opportunity to, to pay homage to my mom um, and my, my family. Thank you, Senator Seberger. Uh, members, we'll have closing comments from Senator Kunish and Gustafson. Before that, I'd like to open up for comments or questions that uh, anybody's got for any of our testifiers or for the senators here or statements that you would like to make. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh. I just want to know how many women are in dairy today that own a dairy farm. Senator, your microphone is uh, uh, acting up again. Uh, I'll repeat the question, but if you try the other one next time, just uh, perhaps someone from MDA might know the answer to that. Does anyone have, we disarticulated in terms of different areas? This is Suzanne from Extension, and I don't have it at my fingertips, but I can look quickly. And as you take other comments, I can look, unless someone immediately knows that. Thank you, Ms. Heinrichs. We'll stall. <laughs> Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, while we're looking for that, uh, just uh, a thank you to all of the uh, women that offered their testimony and their stories and the great stories that uh, are fun to hear, uh, invigorating to uh, think back and, and know what kind of hard work has gone into agriculture, which we uh, like to celebrate here in the Senate Ag Committee and uh, uh, remind our colleagues that our food does not come from the grocery store. It starts where many of these women have talked to us about uh, originating it on the farm or getting in that small business. And so just uh, congratulations to, to all of them and their hard work, perseverance, and um, just want to encourage us. Uh, one of the underlying themes, as, as you hear about all the, the different uh, variety of businesses that people uh, fell into in some cases, or, or by ch one comment about just became a farmer by chance uh, or, or happened to fall into it, uh, you know, these are all small businesses. We do a lot with the cottage food businesses that turn into bigger businesses, but uh, just these are all businesses that sometimes have to follow regulations, and a lot of these uh, dreams become harder to achieve if we overregulate. And so I guess I just think it's a good time for us to think about 
everything we pass here translates into more struggles for women or other people starting out into businesses, and uh, so many of these stories have just been encouraging how small businesses do start. But uh, let's make sure we keep that a healthy environment in our state and uh, just continue to celebrate the great success that uh, we've heard about here from Black Duck, uh, where I went to college in Bemidji, so I know where that is. Um, but Black Duck to southern Minnesota, Cannon Falls, uh, across the state. Uh, great, great uh, stories. Thank you for them. Thank you, Senator Westerman. And I would add to sort of extend uh, your comments uh, how grateful I was to hear how many of our producers who shared with us today, uh, how grateful they were for the support that they received from the state, whether that was in the form of grants or other kinds of decisions that we've made. And add to that uh, in this context of the kinds of burdens that people have to bear or the struggles that they have to meet, uh, the tremendous creativity that we heard about today, um, whether it be government or the weather. Uh, Minnesota's farmers are strong, and Minnesota's women's farm farmers are extra strong. We heard that clearly today. Uh, so thank you for all the testifiers. Ms. Heinrichs, do you have some math for us yet? I have some math, but I can't divvy it out into just women. So I know that there are 2,185 farms in Minnesota that have over 400,000 dairy cattle, but I am sorry, I am not able to figure out how many um, are just women owned or women led or women working on that farm. I apologize. No, thank you for, for uh, uh, attempting and doing the research, Ms. Heinrichs, in the first place. It's a fascinating idea and an interesting question, especially when Ms. Huff told us a lot about how, how many cheesemakers there are in Minnesota who are women. It's interesting to see uh, you know, which industries and which outputs are uh, most commonly uh, cultivated by uh, different demographics in our community. Senator Anderson, do you have another question or another comment? Senator Dames. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I want to thank Senator Kunish and Senator Gustafson for putting this together. Certainly appreciate it, and I hope you turn this into an annual event. And certainly want to thank all the women that are in agriculture and for what they do that got recognized today, and also include those all that didn't get recognized today but are involved in agriculture. It's very interesting to see how many women are involved in agriculture from from the production level all the way up to the corporate level. So I hope you turn this into an annual event, and thank you. Thank you for your comments, Senator Dames. And I will say that um, as long as I've got this gavel, we're doing this every year. <laughs> so for a while. Uh, members, any other questions or comments? Senators Gustafson and Kunish, if you had any closing comments you'd like to make. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll just put on my for like over 10 years, I was a world history teacher. And so I'll just put on my teacher hat for a moment and say that we became a civilization that went from being nomads to actually putting up communities and all of that because of the agricultural revolution, which is what helped us domesticate plants and animals. When we did that, most of that work and the thing that turned us into communities and civilizations and countries and nations um, was due to the work that women did. Women are essentially just at the heart of agriculture and started this whole thing. So it makes me very sad to hear the experiences of some of the women in agriculture who were told that they could only own a farm or operate a farm if they married a farmer. Um, but as we know, that is changing. And today was a really good example of how far we've come and what opportunities we can build on to make sure that we are expanding agriculture to everybody who's interested in doing it. 48% um, of farm operators are women. That's according to the 2017 census. So I don't know if that sort of helps you narrow down down a, a number, um, Senator Anderson, but I think we'll, we'll get close to one for, we'll make that a goal for next year's Women in Ag Day to have all that information. And then 27% of principal farm operators are women as well. They make up 36% of all agriculture producers and are listed as decision makers of 56% of farms and ranches. I would estimate that's on the low side, but that's just my guess. I'll have Senator Kunish finish out, but I do, do want to say thank you for allowing us to have this day to highlight some of our most important farmers in Minnesota. 
Thank you, Senator Gustafson. and Senator Kunish. Thank you. Um, and it, it's just been a really heartwarming day to, um, first of all, to have met all these incredible women who work in the agriculture and ranching area. And then putting this whole day together was quite extraordinary. I met so many incredible leaders and women who have uh, are leading in this area. And as, as it was mentioned, the ones that, that aren't mentioned. I was going to actually talk about my great-grandmother, Mary, uh, Maria Patak Kunish. She was a farm girl from Bohemia who came here from Cleveland, Cleveland then Nebraska, then uh, settled in Pine City where she and my grandpa um, started their farm. But I don't know how many of you saw in yesterday's uh, paper, and there is an article, a copy of the article in, in your packet about, uh, and the title is, um, is Paying Overdue Tribute to, my, to His Grandmother, a Minnesota Farmer Recarves re Family History. And he told the story of the Marklowitz family. Um, his great-grandmother was Carolyn, and she had 18 children. They lived in Maine Prairie um, in Kimball, Minnesota. And I'll just give a little bit, but um, Carolyn was German-born. Um, her husband went, and she went from sawing wood to amassing more than a 1,000 acre of farmland, along with 60 cattle, 40 hogs, a dozen horses, and three sets of modern farm buildings. She was born in 1871 and immigrated from East Prussia at 20, married, and gave birth to 18 children. Eight of them died before she did, and six of them as young children. So recognizing the physical toll that this that farming and raising uh, a farm family has on women um, is often sort of overlooked. Uh, the author of the article, Van Doren, said he learned about his grandmother's grueling life from his mother, Olga, who was Carolyn's 16th child. And she told him that her mother would milk in the morning, then prepare breakfast for the family and up to five hired men and then Carolyn would go into her room and have a baby and be expected to be back in the barn for evening milking. And I think that says it right there. Um, Minnesota prides itself in, in our agricultural community and, and the history of agriculture in this, in this state. And I think in a lot of ways, well, almost 100%, we owe it to the women that birthed all those farmers and, and made it what it is today. So thank you for this opportunity to hear from Women in Ag and for us to begin this annual event. Thank you, Senators Kunish and, and uh, Gustafson and Sieber for your leadership on this issue and for helping us talk about it today. Uh, now, members, our, our next topic conversation is Senate File 4782, Cannabis Provisions, Modifications, Appropriations. I am going to remind you before we begin our discussion that we are focusing exclusively on issues that are germane to agriculture. In fact, if you deviate into areas of other statutory relevance, Ms. Painter will fly into a rage. <laughs> Um, to start us off, uh, I think Senator Port, uh, if you would please, uh, you are virtual, uh, as I understand it, if you could uh, uh, start us off, if you would please, before we begin testimony. Senator Port, are you there? I am here. Right, thanks. Uh, thank you, and good afternoon, Chair Putnam and members. Thank you for allowing me to present to your committee virtually. It is my honor to be here to present Senate File 4782, the first ever Office of Cannabis Management Agency Bill, especially here on Women in Ag Day. The women in the cannabis industry, especially the farmers, have contributed in incredible ways to the work of building this industry, and their input is invaluable. If you recall, last year we did historic work to start correcting the harms and fa failures of prohibition. Through the 2023 session, the bill was heard in 14 committees, took 65 amendments, and became one of the strongest cannabis laws in the nation. As I said then, it will not be the last time that the legislature hears a cannabis bill. Prohibition of alcohol ended over 100 years ago, and we still hear liquor bills every session. The newly legalized and regulated industry is in its infancy, and we're here to continue the work that we started last year. In partnership with the brand new Office of Cannabis Management, this bill improves and streamlines the licensing process and supply chain. It strengthens our social equity goals. 
accelerates the transition of enforcement, infrastructure, and resources, and it expands protections for medical patients. There are three portions of this bill that fall within the Ag Committee's jurisdiction. The first adds language to Section 2, clarifying that industrial hemp growers and processors can make sales to cannabis and hemp businesses. We had hoped that this would be included in the Federal Farm Act update, but that is not materialized and Council has advised us to include it here. The next piece in Section 23 clarifies that industrial hemp is not cannabis. And finally, Section 47 attempts to revise a definition of social equity applicants specific to farming, previously defined as emerging farmers, which is a federal definition. However, we found that definition to be unworkable in practice, and we will continue this work through Chair Putnam's bill on this matter. I know he's working closely with MDA and many stakeholders like the women you heard from today. It's my intention that when that work has been completed in your committee, that we will simply insert the cross-reference to that definition. And as always, I look forward to the discussion and to partnership with you all on this bill. And now I will turn it over to OCM Interim Director, Charlene Breiner, for some deeper insight into the agency recommendations. Deputy Commissioner Vaubel and other Department of Agriculture staff are also here for technical questions. Thank you, Senator Port. Uh, Director Breiner, if you could please state your full name for the record in your position and commence your testimony when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, committee members. It is uh, great to be with you this morning. For the record, my name is Charlene Breiner. I'm the Interim Director of the Office of Cannabis Management, and I'm joined by Sophie Leininger, who is the, the Director of Government Relations at the office. Um, it's also, I should note, that it was wonderful hearing all of the stories of the women in agriculture, given that nationally only 25% of cannabis businesses, including cultivators, are owned by women currently. We hope to see women cultivators enter the space here in Minnesota uh, over the course of the next year. So I want to thank Senator Port and this committee, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to present our proposals to this committee. Senator Port did cover the first provision included in the first engrossment of Senate File 4782 that's under the jurisdiction of this committee. So I just want to focus on the additional two provisions that are under the purview of the committee as part of OCM's recommendations. Uh, just to lay the framework for how we are viewing what we are bringing forward in our bill this year, it is really viewed through two lens, which is to strengthen the underlying foundation of Chapter 342 that is very clear in the law that you passed last year, to make sure that we can implement uh, well and on a t in a timely manner, and to regulate effectively over time. So the first change that we recommend to the statute within the purview of this committee addresses a potential issue where people without a license growing cannabis could potentially argue that immature plants are legal to grow because they have not yet reached the 0.03% THC threshold that would define them as cannabis under current law. By calling out the specific growing stages of the cannabis plant and clearly excluding industrial hemp, we seek to resolve this potential issue. This provision reflects edits from our ex experts on the implementation team and uh, information and insight that has been provided from subject matter experts at MDE, including Tony Cordellette, who is uh, the head of the Weed, Seed, and Fiend Division at the Department of Agriculture and is also here for any questions you may have specific to this provision. The other proposed change that we propose to make in Statute 342 comes from feedback from advocates related to the emerging farmers definition as Senator Port indicated. Subsequent to our bill being introduced, we learned that you, Chair Putman, are working with MDA to address the, the definition of emergent emerging farmers in Minnesota statutes. And so as Senator Port indicated, our goal is to continue working with the chair, with this body, and with MDA on the standalone bill in Senate File 5049, which will, address, will, which will address the issue. We believe it is in our best interest at OCM and in the best interest of cultivators and uh, applicants to OCM that this definition is aligned across agencies for both regulatory effectiveness and ease of understanding expectations for those applicants. 
And with that, uh, that covers the two provisions, and we'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Director Briner. I think we could start with some questions. Now, we do have two more testifiers. Um, but if there are any immediate questions for um, the director, we can handle those, or we can get to them in a moment. Seeing no motion at this point, let's go on to our next two testifiers. Um, but uh, uh, Director Briner, if you wouldn't mind sticking around, because good chance we're going to pull you back up in a little bit. Um, Ms. Flick, who is online, uh, if you could please uh, turn on your microphone, state your full name for the record, turn on your camera, and um, commence your testimony uh, when you're ready, please. My name is Nicole Flick, and my husband and I own a registered cannabis retail location in the Moorhead area. I had to open this retail location as my landlord wouldn't let me out of my lease when I downsized my child care center and could no, no longer operate in the space due to cost. This was for a while saving my child care center from closing, as we could under law sell THCA flour, which is federally defined as hemp, and when it's also part of the plant, uh, that's in our gummies. Then Minnesota decided to classify it as marijuana, even though it's federally legal hemp, which allowed them to regulate it and say that we could no longer sell it. Mind you, it came from licensed states with lab reports, and Minnesotans were very happy. It was a gray area, and it worked for the time being while the licensing process was slowly coming together. This was propping up my child care center. Without these funds, which Minnesota received all the taxes on, by the way, my child care center will not survive. Welcome to my world. In this bill, bill, there have been edits to add temporary licensing, meaning the 3,497 registered hemp businesses in the state, only 50 retailers will get a temporary license by lottery. Under this new wording, even if you get a temporary license, you still cannot purchase or sell marijuana. You can only prepare for it. I don't really know what you thought we've been doing for the last six months, but we've only been preparing for the green light. Following extremely strict rules and trying to scrape by with microdose products while we wait for licensing. You can also not license some and not all. That would take away from every small business in the area. There's four of us in my area alone. One, having one and not all, they would all just go to the one. <laughs> um, meanwhile, all of our customers have figured out how to purchase the federally legal higher potency products from other states and get it delivered to their doors or just grow it in, the, in their homes. We are stuck between selling products people do not want and watching them come into our store and walk out with buy, without buying anything in pure disappointment and lack of respect for the state of Minnesota. They say they don't want to buy it from their dealer, but they have to. And my answer is my hands are tied. I'm waiting, just like everyone else. You can walk into a liquor store with your children and buy an entire store if you so desire. Nothing is locked up, nothing is behind a counter, and you can read the warning labels on the products before you buy them because you can grab it off the shelves and you can browse. For some reason, all of our products have to be locked up, even though we aren't allowed to have anyone under 21 in the store. They can walk out of the store with 800 milligrams in any combination of products, yet we can only sell 50 milligrams per bag. Most people eat an entire 50 milligram bag in, in one serving. In any other state, 50 milligram package is considered a microdose. We need to either raise the maximum serving size to at least 100 per bag, or let us sell federally legal items with lab reports. Last week, a lady walked into my store and told me she suffered from PTSD and she hasn't slept more than two hours in three weeks. She was exhausted. All she wanted to do was sleep. People are taking it for medical reasons, to function in their everyday life. Diabetes, high blood pressure, PTSD, anxiety, ADHD. These people voted to legalize it. Now you are telling us we have to wait until 2025 to even begin the application process and then we still won't be valid until a year from now. You have the chance to go sh to show goodwill and listen and meet us halfway. Don't make people find a workaround and get it on the black market you work so hard to eliminate. I appreciate your time, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Flick. Uh, Ms. Dawson, uh, if you would please, uh, it's good to see you again. If you'd come to the uh, desk, please state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready, please. Absolutely, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair Putnam, Senators. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present today. I'll be very quick and brief and to the point with my comments today. For the record, my name is Angela Dawson. I am uh, president of the 40 Acre Cooperative. Uh, I'm, it's the first agricultural cooperative in the region to serve as uh, indigenous and black farmers, specifically looking at uh, ways to be viable and sustainable on the land. Uh, I'm also co-founder of The Great Rise, 
and The Great Rise has been working around the state to encourage conversations across uh, racial and ethnic lines, especially around this question of equity. Uh, my comments today are being presented as both a multi-generational farmer, I'm a fourth generation farmer in this region, and as a licensed hemp farmer for the past three years. Uh, with my time, again, I'm going to just focus on two primary issues. Uh, the first is the conversation around defining SEAs. Uh, I know this is sometimes a trigger word for some that tends to pit people against each other for resources, uh, but in my work, I've been working to unify around the shared values that is presented around this conversation, especially within the hemp and cannabis industry. And so I am encouraging us in this conversation to uh, remember rural communities and small farmers when we think about equitable access. You may know that due to low commodity prices and rising inflations, we are losing farmers to attrition. And small farmers don't have access to the traditional uh, USDA financing that other farmers are able to have. As a matter of fact, there's a national movement around this called America Needs Farmers, hashtag ANF. This is why I've been advocating for Minnesota farmers who are qualified and interested to participate in the emerging cannabis industry. All of the data points to the growth and economic opportunities that this crop offers. Except for in Minnesota, as a licensed hemp farmer, we've had so much instability the last three years that we've had... Um, regulatory changes that have related that have caused a lot of losses for hemp farmers. So I'm asking for you to include that definition in uh, the licensing priority for farmers. You include farmers who have been disproportionately impacted to including but not limited to incurring operating losses by low commodity prices and or has experienced loss of income or land due to farm related revenue losses. We've experienced a lot of that in the last few years. So uh, so my, my first issue was hashtag Minnesota needs more farmers. Now my second point is just that I'd like to emphasize the delicate grow season that we have here in Minnesota as farmers um, and how challenging it is to have a successful crop. You know that it takes about 12 months from seed to shelf in order to have product available. And so uh, especially in cannabis, that means that's if everything goes well. So in all of your deliberations, please be aware that if we don't get plants in the ground this year, we should be really planning for a 2026 market instead of a 2025 market. That's my other hashtag, plants in the ground. So uh, finally, Chair, earlier today you heard testimony from the women in ag. It was very inspirational for me. I didn't even know it was a great surprise for me to come here and hear this. Um, but many people spoke of the wonderful lessons and skills that they developed uh, from memories here on Minnesota farms. And so I just ask you to please allow us that same opportunity to create and continue that tradition of wonderful memories and skills built on Minnesota farms through the decisions you make today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Dawson. Members, uh, before we begin our discussion uh, of this bill and these issues, I will say for some context, as has been mentioned by Senator Port and um, by uh, Ms. Briner earlier, um, I do have a bill that will engage the question of the language around social equity and what, what it means to be uh, that kind of farmer. We're working on that still. Uh, we will have that bill ready for uh, presentation in this committee likely the first or second week of April. So we will be having a very robust and I predict energetic conversation uh, about this issue uh, in a little bit. We can uh, bring it up today too, but just know that we have a whole bunch of time dedicated to talking that through and we're still in process. So members, do we have any questions or comments for the testifiers or the bill's author? Senator Dames. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Port could probably answer this, or if not, maybe the commissioner could. But my question is, in Section 47, when we talk about changing the definition, it says cannabis farmers or cannabis, an aspiring cannabis farmer who faces barriers to education or employment. Could you give me some idea what these barriers in education are? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for the question, Senator Dames. Uh, Chair Putnam and Senator Dames, this is uh, a lot of what you heard earlier today. Um, women, people of color, uh, people who do not have previous generational experience in farming have a harder time accessing loans, uh, accessing equipment, 
uh, accessing the kind of training and um, education that often comes just sort of through um, you know, being around farming, engaging with farming. Um, and so really we want to expand the base of farmers in uh, Minnesota. And we have seen a lot of interest from women, um, from communities of color, particularly the Hmong community is very, very interested uh, in becoming, uh, you know, expanding their agricultural roots here in Minnesota. And so that is what it's trying to get at. And that is where Senator Putnam's bill to really figure out what that language is um, will come into play. And, and at that point, my intention is to remove this language, which is sort of here as a placeholder, and instead put in a cross-reference to the language that Chair Putnam uh, and the department finalize. Thank you, Senator Port. And I would add that um, developing this language within ag specifically, there's historical justification for doing so as well. Um, you may recall that we expanded the beginning farmer's tax credit last session. Mm -hmm. And when we did that, we had a discussion of very similar questions. And one of them is that historically, uh, and not that long ago, uh, there were uh, moments wherein distinct populations were explicitly excluded from getting state help uh, for uh, agriculture. Uh, in USDA grants and any other places where it was not an issue of identity necessarily, it was explicitly stated, folks like this can't apply for resources. That's one of the very important variables that we're considering as we're crafting this language to make it as precise as possible. Senator Dames. Well, thank you for the follow-up, Mr. Chair and Senator Port. I think, Mr. Chair, you're deviating when you start talking about all the other things you're bringing up. I'm talking specifically of education. And last year, if I remember, we passed a bill that uh, would give free education to folks for post-secondary or, sec yeah, post-secondary. And currently, we have a state law that requires education for the up to the 12th grade. So is this not going to help with that barrier uh, when, at this point, Somebody that wants to get educated can get educated uh, and we'll take care of that bill from the state either through E12 or post-secondary. This would be, isn't this an opportunity for folks that want to get more education about agriculture and things like that? Wouldn't that work? Well, Senator Names, I would, I would um, obviously I'll turn it over to Senator Port in a second if she'd like to answer this as well. But I would say that uh, I'm very proud of those programs to increase access to education. Increasing access is not guaranteeing it would be uh, one variable. And I'd also say that education is just one of many uh, factors that we're considering in the construction of this definition. And each of them actually interacts with the other ones in significant ways as well. So um, the definition that we're working on would not simply be a list of categories, but would involve understanding of how those categories interact with each other. Uh, Senator Port, would you like to answer that as well? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Dames. Um, I think that's exactly right, uh, Chair Putnam, but I will also add um, that, you know, when we put in this, when we created this bill and knew that specific communities had been harmed more than other communities by prohibition, that part of the goal of this bill was to work to undo that harm um, and to specifically help to engage communities that paid very high costs uh, as compared to other communities through prohibition. Um, I would love if in 15 years we didn't need a social equity uh, component of these licenses anymore because the industry had um, you know, leveled itself off in a way that everyone had an even playing field. I don't think we're there yet, and so that's why we're working on, on this language, but um, I really hope, exactly like you said, Senator Dames, that those education programs help to eliminate more barriers every year. And Senator Porter, is it fair to say that another motivation behind social equity uh, uh, designations or language in a bill like this is to protect small producers. And something that we've seen in other states are these massive corporations um, uh, sort of taking control of this industry. And so that one of the other variables that we're going to be looking in as we, we craft this language is those who have not historically had access to these kinds of things, so smaller farmers, people who are getting started, uh, like the small farmers throughout the state of Minnesota. Is that is that a fair characterization as well, Senator Port? Absolutely, Mr. Chair, it definitely is. Um, you know, as we 
built the, the underlying language on this bill, we dedicated a lot of space for micro and mezzo businesses and for small cultivators um, to have an opportunity to get licenses in this industry. We actually didn't create any sort of monster licenses um, to allow for a huge outside um, conglomerate to come in as some other states have to really try to keep it uh, you know, I think a good example would be sort of similar to Minnesota's craft brew um, industry that exists where there were a, an opportunity for a lot of smaller businesses uh, to really pop up and thrive. Thank you, Senator Port. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I see on Section 47 that you've deleted uh, an emerging farmer, farmer as defined in section 17.055 subdivision one. I wonder if Ms. Painter could give us the definition of an emerging, emerging farmer from statute. Ms. Painter. Uh, Ms. Painter is looking that up right now. So in the meantime, Senator Dornick. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Port for this uh, fix. Uh, so section 47 uh, with the license priorities, I really appreciate you including the military, so thank you for that. Uh, so my question is with those priority of those group, how is the system, do you have one in place of um, prioritizing those that are in that group to choose who gets um, for the license? Director Briner. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator, for the question. Our intention is to look very clearly at the criteria in Chapter 342 that you uh, are probably looking at right now, and to use a third-party verification system to objectively make sure that those applicants who are applying as a social equity candidate for a license actually meet one or more of those criteria. Senator Dornick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, and then the other question I have is, have you guys started taking uh, applications or where are you at in that uh, stage? Director Briner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we are in the process of writing rules. So there are 46 individual references to rulemaking in Chapter 342, which is not insubstantial. Um, so we are working uh, as we speak to write those rules with the goal of having initial language to share. We have done an expansive survey on multiple topics, everything from uh, product testing to uh, uh, safety standards to water quality to environmental and pesticide use, uh, environmental standards and pesticide use. We're developing those regulations as we speak. We'll be sharing early language and hope to have those rules in place uh, by early 2025. Ms. Painter, if you would please, to, an answer to Senator Anderson's question. Mr. Chair and Senator Anderson, in the emerging farmers section of the statutes, uh, emerging farmers are defined as farmers, or aspiring farmers who are women, veterans, persons with disabilities, American Indian or Alaskan natives, members of a community of color, young, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex or asexual or urban, and any other emerging farmers as determined by the commissioner. Thank you, Ms. Painter. Ms. Senator Anderson. Thank you. So. You've, you included in your emergency farmer definition, aspiring cannabis farmer? Ms. Painter? I, I, that's, what I see, uh, that's what I thought I heard in that definition of an emergency, emerging farmer. So I understand, we're just at, Mr. Senator Anderson, we're just asking for clarity that that's what, what was said as part of it? Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Anderson, that's not part of the definition of an emerging farmer in, in statute? Were you asking me what's in the bill? No, I'm just asking. I thought I heard you say when you read the definition, aspiring cannabis farmer. Uh, I, I, I didn't. I think it was aspiring farmer, Senator Anderson. Senator, that so what's the, what's the definition of an aspiring cannabis farmer now that we're putting that in as new language on line 49.6? Well, Senator Anderson, I think that we're still working out that language um, at this so point. So why are we putting that in? 
Senator, my understanding was that. Why not come with a definition before you put it in? Ms. Uh, Director Breiner. Sounds like federal legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator. So OCM included language in our bill that was introduced several weeks ago. We did so because many people came to us and lifted up that the current definition and cross-reference could be a challenge. Um, we subsequently learned, as I mentioned, that uh, Chair Putnam was working on an updated definition with MDA, and we want to work very closely to make sure that that definition is consistent. And so really, I think that you should look at the aspiring cannabis uh, farmer language as a placeholder as we continue having conversation uh, to settle on a definition that we can then cross-reference in our, in our statute. Thank you, Director Breiner. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Volvo, would you like to add to that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I just want to echo that that we're working um, closely with um, Senator Putnam and, and others um, and are um, in close contact with OCM. So once those conversations happen and a, a new uh, definition comes to, comes to pass, we'll be communicating that with OCM as well. Senator Anderson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, testifiers. I'll remember that when I put in legislation to put in placeholders for my legislation too. Just for clarity's sake, Senator Anderson, uh, there is a, a calendar situation here and that I'm working on this currently uh, with some other folks and they're working on that uh, the way that they are. And I actually appreciate uh, your consideration in realizing that we are currently doing that work and that you will adjust uh, as is frequently done in legislation uh, when we're done here. So I appreciate that, Director Breiner. Thank you for that. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um a little bit to this discussion, but can you remind me what's the, you made some comments uh, at the beginning uh, of the bill. Is this bill being laid over and we're going to bring it up when we have some more answers to this or what's the, what's the plan or path for this today potentially? Senator Westrom, to, uh, today we will be uh, voting on it and sending it on to state and local government and veterans. Okay. So Mr. Chair, um, if we do that, Will we get another chance to look at this when some of these placeholders maybe are worked out, defining agriculture and farmers, or bring it back to this committee? Senator Westrom, as I said earlier, there is only one uh, placeholder situation, if that's how we'd like to characterize it. I would prefer to characterize it as an amendment. Uh, mm -hmm. There is that one concern that we're still working on in terms of this definition. As I said earlier, we will have uh, a session for ourselves to figure that out in about a week and a half, most likely. Uh, so the one remaining bit of mystery uh, is something that we're going to have a whole session probably to talk through. Does that make sense, Senator Westrom? Okay. And, and is that in another bill form, Mr. Chair? It or? is, Senator Westrom. I have, currently have a bill that has been introduced, um, uh, Senate File 5049. Um, that bill is introduced. It does have some different language, but as I said earlier, I'm still working uh, right. with our friends at MDA to make sure that that language is as useful as possible, which is the goal. So, uh, members, if you'd like, you're welcome to look at the bill as it's currently constructed, but realize that we're still working on that language. So again, Senator Westrom, to your, your valid point, um, the only thing that would change uh, for this bill, were we to view it again, would be this definition. We're spending a whole session, most likely, on, on this definition itself. Okay. So that, I think, is, is uh, perfectly adequate uh, oversight and opportunity for conversation. Senator Westrom. And, and Mr. Chair, a little to the same question for Senator Port um, or testifier. Um, could you explain to us uh, with more with certainty how how are they going to uh, prioritize these applications and how does a f a, f a farmer will now become a a, a potential uh, a party that can get a license or an aspiring farmer does one have more weight than the other or if somebody's raising corn and and uh, soybeans right now and wants to farm cannabis as well, uh, they fully meet the, the, the statute criteria, so they would be able to have the same weight and opportunity to get a license as somebody else, uh, uh, Senator Port. Can you explain that, how that's going to be uh, fair and, 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 and processed? Senator Port, would you like to take this, or should we ask our, our friends from OCM? This seems like this might be 
for them as well. Yeah. Thank you, Chair Putnam. I'll, I'll jump in quick and then I will turn it over to Director Briner. Um, the, the first thing I wanted to address is, is your first part of the, your question, Senator Westrom. Um, it is my intention to not touch the language that you all decide in your committee work um, should be the aspiring farmer language. It is my intention with this bill only to cross-reference cross once you all have done that work. Um, so I, I value your input. This is the committee that work should be done in. It will be done through Senator Putnam's bill. Um, and then I will simply cross-reference to it. Um, as to the prioritization of licenses, um, I'll let Secretary Briner or Director Briner go into detail, but, but say that um, there is intention to have sort of a vetting process uh, to ensure that they meet all the, the standards, all the requirements, um, and then it goes to a lottery. Um, but I will let Director Briner get into more detail on that. Thank you, Senator Port. Director Briner. Thank you, Senator. Uh, and thank you, Senator Port, or Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, so first of all, we, I, I just want to reiterate what Senator Port said. It is not our intention to have a separate definition in the cannabis law. It is our intention, uh, similar to what exists in 342 right now, which is a cross-reference to the definition used by the Department of Agriculture. So that is our, we're waiting and we'll follow your lead. I also should, Senator Anderson, I should also have not used the word placeholder because it was not until after, and so I, I misspoke, it was not until after we had introduced this language that we realized Senator Putnam was working on this language and we really do want to follow the lead of this committee in that definition. In terms of the prioritization, uh, we will, as I mentioned before, look very clearly at the definitions in 342, including the new definition of an emerging farmer, what, what it is called right now, or an aspiring farmer. Um, and we will use that criteria to vet the status of those applicants. Once we do our initial vetting of both social equity status and due diligence on the requirements in Chapter 342 about what license applicants actually have to submit to our office, then if we have more applications uh, than we do licenses available to issue, we will enter those applications into a lottery. But there is a substantial vetting of both social equity status and uh, sort of due diligence and readiness for uh, license application criteria before that lottery takes place. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, uh, thank you for that, uh, Ms. Breinert. Um, can, can you go into a little bit more for us, and I think it would be ripe for us to talk about it a little bit here, but it seems like some of the reason we are changing this is there is a lawsuit going on. Uh, what is the status of that lawsuit? What are the issues in the lawsuit? And is some of it revolve around uh, discrimination or reverse discrimination? What, what's, what's, what's pending in the lawsuit that the Department of Ag is caught up with with the emerging farmer definition? Deputy Commissioner Volvo. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, Director Breiner. I'll Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator. All I was going to do was actually ask my colleague from the Department of Agriculture to speak to that. Commissioner Volvo, Deputy Commissioner Volvo. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Senator Westrom. I know you can appreciate as a, as a lawyer that because it's, it's active litigation, I can't say a whole lot about it, um, but you are correct that um, there is a, a lawsuit against the, the department um, related to our down payment assistance program, um, which is located in 17.133 in Minnesota statute. Um, so there's not a whole lot I can say. I can just say it's, it's active. It's something that um, we are, you know, um, aware of and, and working through, um, but that is that is really all I can say at this point. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Weston, Deputy Wobble, um, can you, you 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 should be able to at least tell us what the issue is in the case because that's a public public document that they've filed, at least alleging this uh, what the issues are and what what are they specifically uh, contesting. Commissioner Volvo. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Westrom. Yeah, so in, um, 
you'll recall in the, the first iteration of the down payment assistance program, it was first come, first serve. Um, and uh, there's a lot of demand for that program. And so um, there was some discussion and we uh, altered the program for the second round to uh, allow for a lottery. But um, the legislation or the, the law uh, dictated that we give priority to emerging farmers as defined in 17055. Um, so the, there's a, a, an individual who um, did not receive um, a, a down payment assistance grant um, and is uh, alleging that that is due to the fact that um, he is a white male. Senator Westrom. So Mr. Chair, just to kind of tie a bow on this, uh, what I'm understanding from you is this section is not going to be fixed today. It is language that uh, changes the current statute um, and probably does open it up to more people to be able to um, fairly try to get into the business if they want to, including veterans. Uh, but what we pass out of here today will be augmented potentially or likely with what we would have a discussion on in about a week and a half here in the committee. Is that is that a fair accurate? Exactly, Senator Westrom. So thanks for putting the bow on it because we're going to take the bow off in a week and a half. <laughs> um, we'll get right back at it. And I will just tell you, okay. just um, I think some of you know that this is a, a, an issue that I've explored as a scholar in my, my daytime job. And uh, one of the things that I'm working on is making sure that we can understand um, uh, a condition rather than a mere identity, but a condition. And to talk a little bit about access uh, a little bit uh, more precisely. So while I think that there is um, a sense that this discussion was instigated by litigation, it's not. It's a legitimate conversation that I think we need to have. And I'm looking forward to having it in, in a week and a half. But I will tell you that that's a big part of my interest in shaping this is, goes back to what we were talking about a little bit earlier too, um, is that when we talk about people who don't have access to capital, um, we're talking about our local communities, our friends and our neighbors. That's who we're trying to protect and trying to give a, an extra opportunity to, especially in light of the tremendous consolidation and corporatization of agriculture. And this is something that we're seeing in uh, the cannabis field as well. Uh, so our goal is to protect the small farmer, to protect the starting farmer, um, the person who doesn't have access to, to some of the conveniences that you and I do. Uh, and that is the spirit that's um, uh, animating the conversations and the discussions that we're having to come up with better language. Um, now, I'm expecting that that language is probably still not going to be perfect when I bring it back to you in a week and a half. Uh, but we'll have a great conversation then, uh, I believe, and kind of uh, really take it apart with some depth is, is what I'm anticipating and hoping for. But we'll go back to, to what uh, Director Briner said. Uh, even if we did come up with a perfect definition today, we can't do it today. We're going to do it in a week and a half. So, um, spoiler, this is a good beginning of the conversation, but we're going to really do it uh, pretty soon. And Mr. Chair. Senator Western. So, Mr. Chair, just um, to, the, to these issues, I, I guess my question would be a little bit, I think Senator Anderson was talking about it, the barriers to education. How, how do we connect that to the f applicant and decide was it a big enough barrier so they qualify, or was it too small of a barrier? Uh, maybe they just had a learning disability, but they were still able to get through, edu through schooling. Um, so th they're, they're not going to be the barriers we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about somebody that dropped out of school because, you know, reason X or Y. Or they had other reasons. They Education wasn't... A, big enough priority when they were younger, but they saw the errors of their way and wanted to become more educated now that they're 25. Uh, how, how are we going to define that, Senator Port, um, as we tee up this discussion? Because why don't, why don't we just make it available to Minnesotans that want to get into the business if they do? Um, because just because you have a barrier to education doesn't mean that's the reason you have trouble capitalizing your farming operation. There's many farmers that have that trouble all the time, and many have been in the business for a while and for whatever reason might have trouble doing some of the same things, Mr. Chair, that a, a new person starting out. And, 
and I don't mind us helping somebody starting out, but what I do get a little concerned about is if this is going to be the people that get the license and everybody else is boxed out, then it really puts the state in a spot of picking winners and losers and uh, arbitrarily deciding who's got the barrier to education and who doesn't. And uh, everybody's circumstance is a little different. We heard it from a lot of the testimony earlier today and how some kind of fell into their farming operation by, by uh, dumb luck, if you will, uh, which they seemed grateful for, but it wasn't part of their plan. Um, others, uh, you know, had different opportunities. So I, I guess, Senator Port, can you just talk about the barriers to education? How are we going to decide it? And what is your intent? And I guess then, Ms. Breinart, if you're going to be part of that discussion, I'd, I'd appreciate a, a more clear answer because it seems to me very nebulous. Senator Westrom, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to sort of reverse the order of those answers um, because I think that, uh, um, uh, Director Breiner, that's a very practical question. Uh, and so to perhaps paraphrase, um, are the only licenses that are going to be offered to people social equity licenses? Or is there a procedure for other licenses that are not so designated? And then secondarily, uh, Senator Port, if you would opine on the larger question about access, I think that would be helpful. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Westrom. Um, that is a practical question, and the answer to that question is we will have rounds of applications for social equity applicants, and then we will have for uh, what we are calling right now a general application price process. And so uh, the social equity designation is to create space for these operators who might not otherwise have opportunity, who have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs, or who may face other barriers to entering this industry. But we also recognize that there is room in this market for all types of operators, uh, for larger businesses, for smaller businesses, and that Minnesota has an opportunity to make space for businesses of all types. And so Oh, no, we are not only going to be offering license, uh, licenses to social equity applicants, but we will also be offering them to general applicants who will be submitting their license criteria and their applications to us as well. Senator Port, to the larger question, if you would, wouldn't mind. Thank you, Chair Putnam. Um, and I, you know, I think Director Breiner hit a lot of it. Um, when we passed this bill last year, a core tenant of it was that the prohibition, the war on drugs, uh, had done disproportionate harm to different communities. And that because that was a state-run, uh, country-run prohibition, that we have a responsibility as a state to undo the harm that was done. Um, and so through that bill uh, last year, we put an emphasis on opportunities for people who had been more impacted, for people who do not have a, a normal sort of um, automatic line into this industry to make sure that we were making space for people who had been disproportionately uh, impacted, for people who didn't have access to money or generational wealth to be able to, to come into this industry as well. Um, and so that was a core tenant of the bill that we passed last year. It's sort of not really up for debate in this program as it's already part of the agency's requirements um, in how they set up these uh, licenses and how they set up the industry. I would say more specifically this year, we are fine tuning um, pieces like the emerging farmers definition uh, to make sure that as we you know, start this process as the agency actually sets up uh, the administration of vetting and testing uh, and cultivating um, all of these different kinds of licenses that they have the, the specific wording and the specific uh, criteria with which they are able to do that. But really the basis of this work was done in the bill last year. Thank you, Senator Port. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Reinhardt and Senator Port, for that answer. Um, I think it tees up what our discussion will be robust and, and uh, about in, in a week and a half or so when we 
bring this back up. Um, I think it's helpful to kind of frame frame the the field and uh, figure out you know some options or, or intent at this point. So um, one last question, Mr. Chair. I'm just wondering if they could. Um, Senator Port or one of the testifiers could explain the process of the Health and Human Services and how they're going to grant the permits to the to the applicants as well. Uh, Director Briner, oh, Mr. Sorry. Chair, you're supposed to take my bait because I was actually out of out of the topic and I wanted to see Laura fly out of her chair. <laughs> Well done, well played, uh, Senator Westrom. Um, I have no further questions. <laughs> but wait, we can give you a free pass on this one if you, you want to. Mr. Chair, I actually I'll hold Laura a, back. I actually have an answer for that. <laughs> <laughs> Director Briner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Westrom. Um, as you might be aware, eventually the Office of Medical Cannabis will be transitioning over to the Office of Cannabis Management, and so we will be re uh, we will be issuing the licenses according to the criteria in statute to any of the medical manufacturers and medical providers. Um, currently, the medical program is under the purview of the Department of Health, and the medical manufacturers are actually registered with the state, so they don't actually even hold a license right now, and they will be uh, required to hold a license uh, upon that transition. Thank you. Uh, Senator Kupak. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I have been working with uh, Ms. Flick, who testified earlier there, so I'm just trying to get a little clarification on one piece for her on the uh, hemp flower. So I know she's got some that comes up to the point three. Is that still okay for her to continue to sell that hemp flower? Ms. Brennan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Kupek. Uh, Kupek. Um, we did provide some education to the current hemp retailers and to the distributors and manufacturers. So we have an issue uh, in Chapter 342 in which the Department of Health has the authority to regulate the hemp-derived products you see on shelves all over the state, um, about 3,800 of them at last count uh, as of last week. And the Office of Cannabis Management has the authority to regulate sales of cannabis flour. And uh, what we have found is during this period of ramping up that there are some sales happening of flour that exceeds the threshold, the definitions for hemp uh, as we look at the federal statutes. And so we sent some guidance to retailers that as long as you have a COA, you're legal. As long as that COA states that the dry weight is under the 0.03 uh, delta 9, you're legal. And as long as the total concentrations of THC post decarboxylation, the fact that I can barely say that word is a testimony to my learning curve, um, which is really the process of heating it up, which creates the delta-9, which is the psychoactive substance. As long as you do not exceed uh, total THC, uh, then you are legal. And so if that hemp flower is actually under that threshold of 0 0.03, then it should be legal. Senator Kupak. Sure. So, so thank you, Mr. Chair. So, but after they light it up, if it goes above that, then is that not legal? That's Ms. correct. Ms. Briner. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Kupak. That is correct because that is the federal definition right now. And I would uh, look to my colleagues at the Department of Ag to give you more detail about that. They're far more conversant on this than I even am. Great. Thank you. Okay. Members, any other questions? Comments? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I noticed that on the bottom of page 48, it, you've added the word cannabis or marijuana, and, and you're reflecting back on the other lines within uh, that section where you've put cannabis or marijuana, vice versa. But when I look on page 49, it says a large amount of cannabis enforcement. Should there be not another word or marijuana enforcement? I, I'm just... I'm seeing you're adding cannabis in to go along with marijuana, but then on the other side, I don't see marijuana along with the cannabis. I'm just, are they not this one and the same or are they different? 
Senator Port, maybe that's a question for you in terms of the construction of the bill as a whole and the use of those two words. Is there a deliberate effort to use them in conjunction? Are they synonymous? What's the scoop? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Anderson, can you point me to where you are looking at? Page 48, you've added the word cannabis on line 28 before the word marijuana, cannabis or marijuana. You've added that word in there. But then on the next page, it says a disproportionately large amount of cannabis enforcement, but you don't have or marijuana enforcement. I'm just wondering if there's a concern, if there's a difference between cannabis and marijuana. I thought they were one and the same, but maybe they aren't. Mr. Uh, so Director Briner. Explain. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator, for the question. The reason that it is specifically cannabis, we use the term cannabis throughout the bill, but we retain marijuana in this section because it pertains to military veterans who may have been dishonorably just discharged, and they use the word marijuana in that dishonorable discharge. So we want to preserve and maintain that protection for applicants who may have been adversely impacted, including up and up to a dishonorable discharge. Thank you, Director Briner, for that explanation and for that decision. Senator Anderson. Hi, members. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, oh, okay. No. I just want your attention before you go to a vote. Oh, sure. Uh, I was just going to ask Senator Seberger to turn on her camera and her microphone uh, as we're about to vote. But before we do that, um, uh, Senator Port might have some closing comments. Senator Dames, would you like to go first? No. Nope. Right. All right, Senator Port, if you would please, any closing comments that you've got? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, thank you very much for your time and discussion. I look forward to uh, staying in touch with Chair Putnam as you all move forward with the definition work uh, in your committee and look forward to uh, directly referencing that in our bill as we move it forward. Thank you, Senator Port. Senator Dames. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The bill is not in the condition that we need to be in with this move. So, Mr. Chair, I move the table of the bill until the bill is in order to be moved to the next meeting. Thank you, Mr. Senator Dames moves that the bill be tabled. Um, for the record, the chair opposes. Uh, but we will all vote on that now. Any discussion? Senator Westrom. So, Senator uh, Westrom has asked for roll call, roll call, asked for roll call granted. Members, for clarity's sake, uh, the vote that we're taking now is to table uh, this bill rather than to move it forward. Senator Port, do you have an opinion on the motion? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I oppose this motion. Um, as already stated, our intention is to uh, continue to work side by side with MDA and insert the definition that you all do uh, during the work of your committee. Uh, it's simply a time management issue at this point, and we will defer to your committee's work. Thank you, Senator Port. Uh, members, just one more time for clarity. Um, uh, uh, oh, Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, I just, I guess I would just urge that we, we put the clutch in. Uh, we aren't going to have meetings till next week. Uh, recess uh, for Easter is coming upon us uh, with no more session days in between now and when we return on noon next Tuesday. Uh, week and a half, we'll be back in committee working on this. So I, I think it would be better for the committee process to look at this, work on this, and, and, and fix it, or work on the fix when we're maybe have more things in front of us and, and more thought and time to go into it. And so I guess I think, I think the Dames motion would be a prudent motion at this point in time, uh, given, given the discussion and the, the questions that we would have and the items that, that we really do need to work on fixing here in this committee. And so with the Easter recess upon us, I don't think we'd, it's really going to cause that much delay, but I think it's big enough to try to get this right or closer to right. Um, and, and we aren't going to be having session for over a week now anyways. So 
I'd yeah. urge people to vote for it. Thank you for that perspective, uh, Senator Westerman, for your motion, Senator Dames. I would remind us, however, that there were only three issues that are ag-specific, which are the only ones that should be germane or relevant to our conversation or for this decision. And the only thing that we've discussed as being something that needs to be ironed out is this definition that we will iron out uh, and have opportunity to make complete. So there is actually no rational justification for postponing this if it's to have more discussion, because we're going to have more discussion on the part that's most significant or the only part that's left. So that being said, um, again, for clarity's sake, an I vote is to table the bill and not allow it to proceed. A nay vote is uh, to keep the bill under discussion and open to, the, to, a, to a motion to move. Um, the, Nick, you'll take the roll. Chair Putnam. Nay. Vice Chair Kupek? Nay. Ranking Minority Member Westrom? Yes. Senator Anderson? Yes. Senator Dames? Yes. Senator Dornick? Yes. Senator Gustafson? No. Senator Kunish? No. Senator Seeberger? No. Uh, what's the count? Uh, the count is uh, four ayes to five noes. The dame's uh, uh, motion fails. Members, uh, Senator Kupek moves that Senate File 4782 be recommended to pass and be re referred to the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans. Any immediate discussion? Seeing none. Uh, all in favor? Oh, Senator Weston? No, no. Okay. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. No. Uh, the motion passes. Senate file 4782 has been passed and referred to the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Senator Port. All right, folks. So um, that's the end of our official business for the day. Uh, we have no meeting this Wednesday. Happy pre-break time. And it gives you all a full 24 hours to celebrate Senator Westrom's birthday, <laughs> which is why we're not meeting on Wednesday. Uh, our next meeting is likely April 3rd, folks. We're still finalizing the agenda, but we'll let you know what it is. Uh, thanks for being here. Have a great break. And we are now adjourned. <laughs>